A very heartly afternoon to all the guests. I am Vishal Khatnani from GH Raisoni College of Commerce, Science and Technology. It's a pleasure welcoming you all in the third session of Orange City Literature Fest Edition 2 by SGR Knowledge Foundation. It's the third session of this fest and time for this session will be from 12 p.m. to 12.40 p.m. This session will be of 40 minutes. We will be now discussing about to open to general public reality in fiction with Ms. Parwanand Ma'am. Parwanand Ma'am is a Sahitya Academy Bial Sahitya Award winner of her book Wild Child, now published as Like Smoke with additional content. She has written books for children, young adults and adults. She also worked with children, especially those in different circumstances, to a program Literature in Action and holds a world record for helping over 3,000 children making the world's longest newspaper. She was invited to speak at the Harvard India Conference USA on disruptive innovation in literature for young adults and children. She has been awarded for contribution to children's literature by the Russian Center for Science and Culture. No guns at my son's funeral. One a rave reviews was on international boards on books young people on a list has been translated into german french german and french she headed the national center for children literature the little bird who held the sky up with the feet was on 1001 books to read before you grow up an international gold standard of the world's best books ever wingless has been performed nationally and internationally she has co-authored graphic novel with Swedish writer Arjun Parsons as a performance storyteller and speaker. She has represented India in USA, UK, Sweden, Switzerland, Singapore, Germany, and Bangladesh, besides all over India. In 2019, she was awarded with Kalinga Karubaki Literacy Award for Fearless Woman to Write. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, Vishal, and thank you. City Literature Fest, uh, who has bravely decided to go online. And I think all of us are having to um, think of new ways and innovations and not think outside the box, but to think inside the box. And what is the box but our screens? So this morning we've had a little bit of disaster, a little, no, more than a little hiccup before we could start because. The first session went in technology. Uh, literature and technology are often not friends. They weren't friends this morning. Hopefully, this session will go well. So um, I'm going to talk on a very interesting uh, subject. I find it interesting, obviously. Uh, reality in fiction. You know, I'm often asked, when I tell a story, I'm often asked, is this story true? And I'm going to start out telling you two incidents. One was I had told to a group of children, I had told a ghost story, and I had told a story on domestic violence, in which a boy seeing, sees his Barbie being hit by her husband all the time, the boy's elder brother. And after the session was over and all of the children were going away to have their snack, one girl remained behind and asked the same question. Is the story true? Are the stories true? And I said, what do you think? And uh, she said, well, the ghost story is obviously not true. But the one about domestic violence, that's definitely true. So I said, how can you say definitely true? I mean, with so much confidence. And she said, because um, it happens in my house. By which time a few children had come back and so many talked about their sisters, their mothers, even grandmothers who were being slapped around, verbally abused, mentally abused, by their husbands, by their fathers even, sexually abused even. So I said, what do you feel? 
when you hear this story, what do you feel? And they said, we, they said, we feel angry, we feel sad, we feel frightened, but most of all, they felt helpless. And I knew then that I did never want children to be left with a feeling of feeling helpless. And how can I, as a writer, help children not to feel helpless? And so I started writing more and more books that are based in reality. I've never written another ghost story after that, but I have written books that confront reality that children are already confronting. The second incident I wanted to tell you about was uh, in Northern Kashmir, very close to the line of actual control, there was a group of children and I told them a story and they enjoyed the story. They were frightened at the correct parts, laughing at the correct parts. They were tense at the correct parts and they laughed when the end came. And they enjoyed the story, but I could make out they were a little bit uh, uneasy. So I said, what, what is it? And uh, one boy said, is the story true? Again, that same uh, the same point is the story true and I said what do you think and this it was a story about a bear who climbs on the moon so obviously that was not reality fiction so I said well oh no of course it can't be true and they all went you know oh. so I said what happened and they said if it's not true it's a lie and but they did not know what a story is. And I had never met a group of children who didn't know what is a story. So then I helped them understand what is fiction. But when they started writing their stories, and many of the children I have worked with, a big, big group of them, are actually orphans of violence. They've lost their parents to violence. When I ask them to write a story, they always write about that Hadza, the time when their parent was killed. Because they first have to tell that story, because that is the story which is stuck in their throat. That is the story that is choking them and it has to come out. And one of the best ways to express it is through a story. And when I'm talking about difficult things, if I'm telling the story, if I'm telling, talking about it through the safety net of a story, and it is a very safe space, fiction is a very safe space because you're talking about a made up person, a made up circumstance, although actually it is a true circumstance. So um, I realized that children need to know the truth. They need to be told the truth because they are facing the truth already. They are trying to understand it, trying to fight it, grapple with it live with it, accept it or reject it. And so I started telling more and more truth in my stories. And I'm going to read to you from one very difficult story. And you know that I write for children and I'm often asked, why would you write such a difficult story for children? Um, so where are we? Let me find the page. This is my book called The Other. Okay, The Other. Uh, and the story that I'm going to tell you is called Learning to Love Again. And I'll come back to why that title once I've read this. You don't know my nightmares. You don't see the dark shadows looming above my bed or smell the whiskey on his breath, or feel the weight of him as he presses against me, crushing my body as his hand roughly shuts down my voice. 
Sometimes I awake from non-sleep to find myself in a sweat, shaking and trembling like an earthquake has hit my bed. I'm too frightened to move. I can't scream. He's taken my voice from me. And so my screams are trapped in my chest, choking me, choking me with those hands, those hands, pudgy and soft, like there was no bone underneath, but strong, stronger than the whiskey on his breath, the heat of him, the weight of him, and I'm screaming again. Deep inside my being, I'm screaming, my mouth stretched wide, my throat hurting from silent screams that scratch me. I'm not going to read the whole story because it's a story that has to be read in silence. Yes, it's a story about rape. And yes, it's a story about, it's four children. It's about a young girl who is raped. And yes, I'm asked by many adults, why such a story for children? In fact, I was asked by Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. He, he honored me on uh, Republic Day at Rashtrapati Bhavan for this book, No Guns at My Son's Funeral. And he told me, he said a very he said it very sweetly. He said, Paro, you have such a lovely smile. And you write for children, but why and this is a very good book. He had read the book. But he said, Why such a book for children? Why not a happy book? This is about a boy who becomes a terrorist. And I said, Because it's not a perfect world. It's not a perfectly happy world and children do know about rape and they do know about terrorists. And in a, in a school not long ago, I had talked about a story from this book about a girl who is brought up to hate Muslims because she is told that her father was killed by a Muslim bomb. And then they leave the place they belong to and they come away to a city. And there she meets in her school, new school and she falls in love with a boy who turns out to be Muslim. And when she finds out that he's Muslim, she starts to hate him because she's been taught to hate. And she, um, and he, he they, they argue. And he says that all Muslims are not terrorists and bombs don't have a religion. Now, after this telling of that story, one boy, he was a 12 year old boy, the, the, the same age as the boy in this story. And he said to me, this boy in Rajasthan, he said, ma'am, I'll agree with what you said in the story that all uh, Muslims are not terrorists, but you'll have to agree with me that almost all terrorists are Muslims. And what do you have to say about that? And I can see Vishal also nod. You've heard this before, right? We've all heard it before. This is a common argument. All Muslims are not terrorists, agreed, but you'll have to agree that almost all terrorists are Muslims. So I was, I was very fortunate that the answer came to me there on the, at that moment. And I said, okay, Beta, let's put aside the question of religion for a moment. Let's look at another crime. Let's look at the crime of rape. And I said, of course, we can all agree that all men are not rapists. 
of course all men are not rapists but bache you will have to agree with me that almost all rapists are men so then by your logic ki bhai because almost all terrorists are muslim let's hate all muslims we'll be safer like that let's not give our houses on rent to muslims let's not give jobs to muslims let's not be friends let's not marry right let's have love jihad these are all things that we know right i said so let's do the same with men i said let's treat all men as potential rapists but rapists to men hote hain let's treat let's treat all men as as potential rapists and have nothing to do with them we'll never be friends we'll never marry a man we'll not uh, we we'll have nothing to do with our fathers we'll have nothing to do with our uncles how about that is that acceptable to you and i told him i said beta i know nothing about you vishal i know nothing about you i don't i didn't even know that boy's name i said but i'll hate you why because you are a potential rapist because you're a boy and is that acceptable no of course it's not acceptable so they got it then this was a group of 12 year old children and i just wanted to say that they all knew what does the word rape mean they knew it more or less they knew it and if they knew it and somewhat understood it shouldn't there be a safe way that they can talk about it and understand and so this story that i have written is from the point of view of the rape victim and her family and her friends and a boy who really likes her and doesn't know what's happened and her teacher and the title i told you i'll come back to the title is learning to love again because no matter how harsh the reality what i want to say to young people is that there is always hope don't lose hope yes sometimes things are very difficult don't lose hope there will be an answer and sometimes that answer and sometimes that hope that feeling that i'm not alone can come through a story and that is reality fiction okay now i want to read to you from okay let me read to you from this book being gandhi and then i'll talk about we have time being gandhi now i found when thinking of writing a book on gandhi i said let me see what is out there for children and i found that we have taken gandhi very far away from reality we have made him a god bilkul sukha ke nichod ke unko unka sara ras nikal ke we have stuck him on currency notes we have stuck him into very boring textbooks we have hardened him and put him on to high pedestals as a stone statue and as a metal statue what about the man who was gandhi what about the human being who was gandhi he wasn't perfect because he wasn't a god but if you were to ask a child what do you want to be when you grow up who do you want to be like very few children will say i want to be god nobody will say bade okay mai bahut mai to bhagwan banunga nobody will say that right but surely somebody could say that i'd like to be gandhi but no one says that because you can't be god and we've made gandhi into a god so i decided to write a book on not gandhi the man not the freedom struggle not the you know of how the british rule was broken by gandhi and all of that 
but rather brought Gandhi to a more modern setting so that you people could be um, could understand that and discover that what Gandhi said and what he taught is still very relevant today. Okay, so here goes. And when I go to a school and I say, um, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to read a book on Gandhi and they all are ah, boring, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then I start reading chapter one. The title of the chapter is My Life Sucks, Just Sucks. <laughs> and all the students go, hey, a book on Gandhi that starts with this line? Ye kya hai? You know? Preeti ma'am, she is nice and everything, but you've got to admit she's one of the most boring teachers in the world. It's like a necessary qualification. In an interview, a potential teacher gets asked, are you boring? And the teacher, if the teacher says, if the candidate says, no, no, I'm a very interesting person. I, I have a great sense of humor. Ah, wrong answer. Out next. Because teachers aren't meant to be interesting. They're meant to be boring. Like Now, just think of it. When in a class, a whole classroom bursts out laughing, what does the teacher do? Vishal, what does the teacher do when the whole class starts laughing? What does they the teacher do? Point. Exactly. Why? Because Bahar Pata na chale that there was fun happening in the class. <laughs> but Preeti ma'am, she is the most boring teacher on earth. And I start to make a drawing about the queen of boring is Tan, who is Preeti ma'am? The queen of boring is Tan, where dogs are always asleep and everyone is sleepy, even the trees are marawad and everybody walks around, nothing to do, no laughter, nothing to hear. Ouch! Aha! What is it? Someone has pinched my ear and I'm going to turn around and slap them. But the whole class has, oh, because it is Preeti ma'am. She has pinched my ear and she has snatched this paper from my hand. And she's looking at it. She doesn't smile. She doesn't laugh. She doesn't have a sense of humor. What are you going to do for your project? blank. I don't know what project she's talking about. <laughs> I wasn't paying attention. I was drawing boring his time. Answer me! Um, ma'am, ma'am, I'll, I'll think about it and tell you tomorrow. Bakwas, na, he doesn't know. So what do you do when the teacher's asking you and you don't know what do you do? Right? So I drop my pencil and I bend down and I ask my friend and answer me. As the teacher says, and I quickly stand up, my friend has said, Gandhi, Gandhi. Ma'am, Gandhi is such a vast topic. I, I will have to think very carefully because ma'am, all classes are doing something for Gandhi Jayanti, you know? I mean, every time when October is going to come, Kya karte hai, koi natak, every class is doing from nursery onwards ek natak karte hai, kisi bache ko dhoti pehna dete hai, bichare ko thand mein khada kar dete hai, ek soti pakda dete hai, usko ek ganji wo, uh, wo pehna dete hai, ganja wala wo wig and usko gol chashme pehna dete hai, and bas usko, aur phir koi bache ko coats pehna dete hai ki wo Britishers hai. But boring. Every class, every year, so boring. So, ma'am, we'll, I think, you know, like every time it's Gandhi, Gandhi, Gandhi. Hey, you think you're on first name basis with Gandhi or with the, with the father of the nation or what? And I want to say, ma'am, if I was on first name basis with the father of the nation, I would have said Mohandas. Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. 
And the homework assignment that Chandrasekhar, the boy in the book is given, is to be Gandhi for one week. Be Gandhi, how he says, there are no British, British soldiers and British people to throw out. Oh, shall we throw out the foreign students? But of course, she doesn't laugh. Remember, she has no sense of humor. So she says, Chandrasekhar, you have to be Gandhi. You have to, any action that you're doing, think, what would Gandhi do? And do it like that. And Chandrasekhar thinks, yeah, main nahi karne wala ye homework assignment. Tab bakwaas sa homework assignment. Main nahi karne wala, main kuch bakwaas likh lunga, ki koi aunty ji thi, oh, unke bade bhari bags the. Main ne unko bola, aunty ji, main aapko sadak par kara deta hon, main unke bags utha leta hon. Woh kehte, beta, kitna achha hai tu, aur paise jab woh de rhi hai mujhe, main kehta hon, nahi, nahi, aunty, bas aapki aashirwaad bhoat hai. And then something happens that makes Chandrasekhar maybe think otherwise. Indira Gandhi is assassinated. You know what is assassinated? When a leader, when a world leader is killed, that is assassination. And when she is killed, anti-Sikh riots break out because she was killed by her Sikh guards. And there are riots breaking out and curfew has been imposed, but there are houses and offices and factories being burnt. There are people being pulled out of trains and cars, drivers being pulled out of taxis and burned alive. And all the time Chandrasekhar feels, well, that's very sad, but it's nothing to do with me. But what's it got to do with me? I feel as though I'm growing up every second, aging, like my own life is on fast forward and my teen years are zooming towards adulthood. The television volume has been turned down, but suddenly there is shouting. We all turn to see if someone has turned the TV back up, but no, no one has. The shouting is not out of a screen. It is outside our door. At first, the shouting is confusing, but then the shouting of the crowd makes one sound, one word, blood. The crowd has come for blood. My own blood runs cold, I freeze. Were they coming for us? We all stand in a frozen tableau of terror. My mother moves first. She runs to make sure the doors are bolted. She tries to pull the sofa to block the door so that in case the people outside break in, they are blocked by the sofa. She shouts to my father, come and help me, help me. But he stands there. He shakes his head. It's not for us, he says. And like a jigsaw, everything falls in place. They've not come for us. They've come for the sick family who live in the flat across the corridor. Ma, <laughs> what will they do to him? What will they do to them? But Ma is crying. Ma, what about Kiran and Sharon? Are they going to be okay? Can we go and get them? They're just children, Ma. They're my friends. But we can't do anything. The sounds of cutting and breaking and the smells of burning burst in upon us as though we ourselves are burning, as though we ourselves are breaking. But we can't do anything. 
I go to my room and on my bed are all the books that Preeti ma'am made me borrow. The books I had promised I would not read because they're all on Gandhi. Not knowing what else to do, realizing that the death of the prime minister had something to do with me, I flip open one book. And in it, I see the words, Gandhi's words, in a gentle way, you can shake the world. And a shiver goes down my spine. And I think, if Gandhi was here today, what would he do? He would find some answer. He would find some way. He was Gandhi. And I wonder, can I, can little old odd me, can I be Gandhi? Can I do something? Can I be better? Can I be Gandhi? And yes, the answer is yes. Chandrasekhar finds a way to be Gandhi. And Chandrasekhar finds a way to be better. And other children along with him, other children in the building, they cannot save Kiran and Sharan and the uncle who lives in the flat across. But they can make a change. And you can make a change. And you can make a change. All of us can make a change. And we can be a little bit better. I find very often that when I've told a story, children find themselves in it. And sometimes children say, well, you've written all these stories, you've not written our story. Uh, so we have five minutes to go and I just want to talk a little bit about Nomad's Land. This is my newest and very precious baby. It's a novel called Nomad's Land. Nomad's Land is, who are nomads? Nomads are people who wander from place to place because they don't have a land. So where do they belong? And this book came because there was a Kashmiri Pandit girl who said, ma'am, you've written stories in this and in some other books about the Kashmiri Muslim children and what they have lost. You've not written a story about the Kashmiri Pandit story. So this, I then looked at the Kashmiri Pandit story and found so many things that needed to be said and conveyed and shared with the world out there. But I wanted to show that the Kashmiri Pandits were not the only people who we or others have driven out. Look at the way in the pandemic, migrants had to flee cities. You've heard, you've seen how migrants walked thousands of miles, hundreds of miles, because we city folk turned our backs. We became those Gandhi's monkeys who were blind and deaf and did not speak up for those who were forced to leave. And so I wanted to make another story, which was also a universal story, not just about one people, but about the many who are driven out. And so I made up a tribe called the Kushavans who live on a high plateau. And guess what? I made up their culture. I made up their clothes. I made up their names. I even made up their language. And it was very exciting. And how is this reality fiction when I've made it up all in my head? And there's a very breathtaking incident in it. Uh, ceremony that is performed. And I say breathtaking 
And that's a clue into the book, into the Khushavan way, because there is something that happens which is breathtaking. And these two girls, Pema and Shana, are very different children. One is very shy. This is Shana, who is very shy. She's Kashmiri Pandit, very frightened, shy, subdued. And this is Pema, who comes from a Kushavan family, who um, is very bold, but eventually it's Shana who must step up and help her friend and her friend's family. So where do we belong? That too is reality. And sadly, it's a reality of many, many, many people. Let's not turn, let's not otherize, let's not otherize people. And let's step up and be Gandhi, let's find our inner Gandhi so that no one has to disappear like smoke. Thank you. Just a few of my books that I wanted to share with you. Yes, I am very happy to answer questions. Uh, is there a, is there are there any questions, Vishal? If you'd like to say something, ma'am, uh, it's in the chat box. It's Witness. in the you know I can't I can't read the chat box because I had to do this on my phone. So I think if you could do it better. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. For sure. Hmm. And one of the participants have a question: From where do you get all the inspiration to write such amazing and bold books for children? Thank you. I really like that question. And it has a very simple four, four letter answer from life. Life is my inspiration. You young people are my inspiration. I have worked with over three lakh children, over three lakh children. And I think through the pandemic, I have uh, managed to be meeting people like you. Um, so maybe it's gone, maybe it's crossed three lakh now and through my readers. And I always ask, what do you want to, what is that story that you think I should write? What, on, what should it be on? And the kind of answers yesterday from, a, um, from where was it? I don't even remember where. Hyderabad. There was a child in Hyderabad who said, why don't you write on government corruption? She was, I think, a very young child who, who suggested this. So I think we underestimate children. My only rule is that I try and keep it, keep no matter how hard it is, I still try and keep it a little positive. Yes, ma anything other... else that... Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Ma uh, there are two more questions. Ma yes. I want to know what was your experience, what was your reaction when uh, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam uh, was uh, honored you? Oh, my God, I couldn't believe it. You know, he was a man I so admired, and I had met him once before. Uh, and I thought, what a charming thing that he said to me saying that you have a lovely smile when he told me. And I thought, you know, for a president to take that moment out. And he had selected 18 children's writers uh, to honor that Republic Day. And he had read all our books. And he took time out on Republic Day, which is probably the president's most busy day, to, um, to call us to a private meeting, just 18 of us and Dr. Kalam. I mean, I had great, have great admiration for a person who never thinks themselves too great and too busy and too involved in everything to not find time for others, especially for children. Yes, 
you know he was also a man who um until dr kalam all presidents used to have their shoes put on and laces tied by their uh, by the person who looked after them and apj abdul kalam was the first person who said no that will never happen i will tie my own shoes because he felt you know i i do not need to insult somebody by doing that making them do that i'm perfectly capable uh, the last question any incident which is close to your heart so so many incidents uh well in kashmir i had i would i had done work with orphans of terrorism as i said and there was this one boy who had written i'd never met him he had written his whole story um of what had happened and how his father had died and he gave me that paper to read and he and i somehow became very close during the course of the workshop and then i had to leave and as i was walking to my car to go to the airport i felt there's somebody behind me someone's following me and it was um this boy shabir and i put my hand on his shoulder i said kya baat hai he says mujhe lagta hai ki hum dono ka pichle janam ka saath hai and if you think of it islam doesn't have a pichla janam but yeah we had a connection so i sort of adopted him and he is my son he calls me mom and i call him beta and he just recently got married and we've been together since then that's all ma'am that's all and uh uh to the vote of thanks thank you ma'am on behalf of orange city literature fest by sg knowledge foundation we sincerely express our gratitude towards your acceptance for the session and knowledge shared with us and i also like to thank the publisher penguin classics thank you ma'am thank you thank you 20 years of existence Two universities, twenty-three educational institutes, offering a hundred and thirty-seven courses. Rice Only Group of Institutions, a vision beyond.